Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, this uh, right now it's uh, July twelfth. Uh, I'm talking to my speakers right now. I'm Malcolm McNeil. I'm the president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, uh, and I am very pleased to be uh, the moderator of this program regarding challenging the constitutionality of the FTC. As many of you know, there's been a lot of activity uh, with respect to the enforcement process of both the S FTC and the SEC, and I'm absolutely pleased to have with us as our guest speakers, uh, Larry Ebner. Uh, Larry is the Executive Vice President and the General Counsel to the Atlantic Legal Foundation. I am on the board of the Atlantic Legal Foundation, and Larry and I know each other well. Um, the uh, Atlantic Legal Foundation filed an amicus brief in a case called Axon, which we'll be talking about shortly, uh, and um, he is well versed on the issues that we're going to be discussing during this uh, webinar. Secondly, I want to greet uh, David Shanka. Uh, David is with us, who is a partner at Redgrave uh, LLP, and he's involved in a whole variety of activities uh, on issues of privacy, security, e-discovery, et cetera. But in, in a sense, more important for the purpose of this uh, webinar, David has a distinguished career of having been he served three terms as the acting general counsel at the FTC and 10 years as the agency's principal deputy general counsel. So what David brings to this discussion is some uh, background that might be helpful for those of us who have practiced uh, and, and defended cases involving the FTC, SEC, and other administrative agencies, but weren't quite sure how they work and how those how those investigations take place and how those investigations progress and how best to, to deal with the uh, government's view in each one of those administrative agencies' actions. So with that, um, I'm, I, I gave you gentlemen brief introductions, but for the benefit of our listeners and viewers, we have uh, the bios which are attached to the materials for the program. So with that introduction, I think what I'd like to do is welcome both of you. And David, I'd really like to start with you. I'm going to rush right into it because we have a lot of materials we've talked about. And um, based on your experience, I was wondering if you could enlighten us on the um, on how our FTC investigations started and how are they conducted? And uh, tell me tell me how it gets to the point that I'm representing somebody. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be. Uh, be here today. Uh, as to your question, uh, this of course could take many hours to explain in detail, but very briefly, uh, what, uh, what happens is the FTC staff has the authority to uh, open investigations uh, for any number of reasons, uh, even just to satisfy themselves that there's no reason to investigate, but that is limited uh, by, um, by commission uh, policy and practice to uh, a preliminary phase, uh, usually is characterized as a certain number of hours or whatever. But um, at some point, if the uh, staff wants to go on, continue the investigation, they have to seek approval from the bureau directors and ultimately from the commission itself if they want, uh, uh, if they want um, to use process, uh, CIDs, subpoenas, or whatever. So assuming they, they want process, they'll make a request to the commission for it. The commission will decide up or down. And, um, and if it grants it, then the staff can issue uh, uh, civil investigative demands or subpoenas, uh, take depositions, gather documents, and continue with their investigation. At some point, if they find that there is a, uh, or that they think there's a law violation, they will make a recommendation to the commission, at which point the commission will often uh, and the bureau directors will often invite the parties in to talk and to um, uh, tell them where the staff is, is right or wrong or whatever, and, um, and go through a whole process like that. Eventually, assuming there is there's no satisfactory discussions and the staff continues to believe an enforcement action is recommended, they will go to the commission and with a recommendation, and the commission will vote up or down on uh, on, on uh, issuing either an administrative complaint or going to court. And then at that point, uh, a lawsuit or an administrative proceeding is filed 
and um, the parties are officially involved in a proceeding. But the involvement by somebody such as yourself can begin much earlier during the staff investigation, during the uh, phases when the um, uh, matter is pending on recommendations. Are, are there policy issues that influence the FTC Commission's uh, decisions? as to whether or not to proceed forward or not. I, I, I know that we hear about, you know, protecting the public and integrity and things like that. Is there, is there, a, are there any litmus tests or guideposts? Well, certainly the commission issues, it's, uh, it's a, a legislative or it's agenda, I should say. Uh, it's, it's agenda each year and that is published and is available. And basically what it sets out is the priorities of the agency in various areas and on various issues. Uh, apart from that, uh, the commission pays a lot of attention to what's going on in the, in the background. It may get complaints from Congress, and it will, uh, as likely or not, as not, take a look at that. It may get uh, uh, inquiries from the White House. It may get consumer complaints. It may get complaints from competitors or, uh, or, or uh, people involved in an industry. It will consider those and, and take a look. On the consumer protection side, it has its... Um, uh, uh, consumer uh, Response Center, which takes consumer complaints and registers them. And then the commission will analyze those complaints from time to time to see if there's an area that is of special concern to consumers, new frauds, new, uh, uh, new deceptive practices that need attention. And that will inform its decision whether to go forward in certain areas or, or encourage staff to pursue certain, certain things. We know it takes a little bit of time for cases to work their way through the system. And I, I'm looking now, uh, for example, at the Illumina decision, which I think the initial uh, pleadings were back in 2020, and we're in 2023 now. And um, I noted that the FTC had recent rule changes with respect to the ALJ decisions. Uh, do you have any comment on, or, or were those, I guess the question would be, were those changes, uh, let's say, influenced by the pending litigation as it worked its way to the Supreme Court, do you think? Well, I would find it hard to think it didn't have some influence on that. Uh, but the fact is, is that the changes that the uh, uh, commission made in its, in its uh, administrative law judge decisions are really, I think, more a matter of clarifying existing policy than changing anything. Uh, previously, the, uh, uh, now that's my personal opinion, I, I need to uh, say that very quickly and loudly here, but the fact is, is that ALJ decisions have been, you know, initial decisions, and, um, and they've been subject to appeal to the full commission all along, and the commission has always, as long as I've been there, taken the position that initial decisions were subject to de novo review uh, by the commission. It, take a fresh look at the evidence, take a fresh look at everything and consider it all new. Uh, that has not changed uh, uh, in, in the current uh, or with the rural revisions. Uh, what the commission does now is we label the initial decision into a recommended decision. And it may have made some of the reviews more automatic than they were before. But in, in a very real sense, uh, the commission has always, the ALJ has never issued a final decision unless the parties have allowed it to become final. The commission has always had the right to, um, to review decisions de, uh, sua sponte, and it has always had taken the position that it could review them de novo, uh, taking a fresh look at the evidence. I was noting uh, the success rate of the FTC in its administrative adjudications, and um, I guess the obvious question coming, let's say, from the defense side is, is that, a, is that success rate evidence of some prejudgment or bias, uh, would you say, or, or what would attribute to that, to that uh, excellent success rate? Well, it's certainly if you're inside the commission, you attribute it to careful case selection processes. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's not actually flip. Uh, the fact is, is that the commission looks at things very, very carefully, and it is very sensitive to the idea that staff, nothing is worse for the public than staff running, uh, uh, going renegade, if you will. And the idea is to keep an eye on the staff, to control what they do, and to, uh, and to make sure that they aren't just filing a bunch of frivolous cases. And so the result is that the commission does very much have a hands-on approach about what gets litigated and what doesn't. In terms of, uh, of whether that indicates prejudgment or not, um, I would say two things. 
One is the statutory standard for filing a, a case is whether the commission has reason to believe the law is being violated. And once it files a complaint, it has to be supported by, it has to determine it on the basis of a preponderance of the evidence. Same thing as a federal district court has, preponderance of the evidence. Reason to believe, I would argue, is, is very comparable to what courts do in, in criminal cases with probable cause and then hearing cases afterwards in the very cases where they issued the arrest warrant um, so, uh, or the indictment. So the, um, the fact is, is that the, uh, uh, I, I think the commission uh, has these steps, but on the other hand, I don't think that's necessarily a sign of prejudgment or bias. Uh, one other note is if you take a look at the commission's success rate in the courts of appeals, after they issue final, de final decisions, those success rates are pretty high. And the courts of appeals thought the commission was abusing its discretion or using frivolous evidence or not legally sound, it could readily uh, reverse those decisions and does when it finds that. Do you think that the trend is now going to be such that the those uh, court of appeal decisions change uh, the success rate at that level as a result of the recent decisions and the, the granting of the... Um, uh, assert to the to Illumina and the Jarkezi cases? You know, that's that's a hard question to answer. It really is. It calls for a lot of speculation on the part of what courts may do. What I will say is that, um, and, and this is perhaps going further than I, than I it, than it's prudent, but the fact is, is that uh, uh, there have been times in the past when the commission has been under a lot of attack and a lot of close scrutiny. And the sense inside the commission has been that the commission couldn't buy a successful appeal or a successful case. That the fact is, is that uh, courts don't live in vacuums. They listen to the news, they know what's going on. And to the extent the commission is getting a bad yeah. then they, I, I would expect many judges would act or react accordingly, whether consciously or not. Understood. Well, one one last thing, and then I'd like to switch gears to the Axon case. But um, do because this is important in my practice. I've done a lot of state administrative defense also, and the, does the FTC coordinate with the state consumer protection authorities or antitrust authorities or any corollary, let's say, um, state agencies that uh, are relevant to the particular investigation? Sure, it does so literally every day. And uh, I won't say on every case, there are some cases that the states just bring because they're too small for the feds to be involved with. But I'll push this even further. Not, the FTC coordinates not only with the states, but with foreign authorities too. Uh, nothing's really worse than coming up with uh, decisions in cases that are inconsistent and, uh, and have remedies that are mutually uh, ex ex exclusive, excuse me. Uh, so um, uh, there's a very serious effort to, uh, to make sure that things are harmonized at some level. Um, of course, informed by the rules of evidence and the uh, prohibitions on ex parte communications and all that. But during the period of, of the, during the investigative phases, certainly a lot of coordination. Thank you, David. I'll come back to you uh, as we move through this. And let me switch gears and go to Larry Ebner. Larry, um, you were the one who wrote the brief on the Mika's brief on behalf of the Atlantic Legal Foundation uh, in connection with the Axon case, and I was trying to find a uh, an appropriate introduction of that for our um, for our listeners and viewers. Uh, and I had gone through a bunch of materials, and I found a holding, and I thought I would read that holding to you, and you can tell me whether or not it's correct or not. And the holding says. The holding of the case was that the statutory review schemes set out in the Securities and Exchange Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act do not displace a district court's federal question jurisdiction over claims challenging an unco as unconstitutional the structure or the existence of the SEC or FTC. That's quite a holding, is that accurate? Um, it's accurate and to put it more simply, uh, if you're representing uh, a, a civil enforcement target of either the FTC or the SEC, and presumably other independent regulatory agencies, 
and you have what's called a structural constitutional claim, the court held unanimously that you don't have to endure the entire administrative proceeding and lose in order to then go to a federal court of appeals to raise your structural constitutional claim. Instead, you can file uh, before or during the proceeding in a federal district court under federal question jurisdiction, section 1331, and pursue your structural constitutional claims um, against the um, commissions or other agency. By structural constitutional claim, I'm not talking about um, case-specific uh, claims regarding evidentiary rulings, uh, or preliminary legal rulings made by an administrative law judge. Uh, Justice Kagan wrote the combined opinion in these two cases, Axon versus FTC and SEC versus Cochran. And um, she explained that uh, these are what she called existential claims. These are claims that go to the very existence of the FTC or the SEC or other independent regulatory agency. Uh, they're not case-specific claims. Just by way of background, Axon Enterprise uh, was targeted by the FTC for an allegedly uh, anti-competitive um, acquisition. Uh, Michelle Cochran, uh, a CPA, was targeted by the SEC for an alleged failure to comply with some paperwork requirements under the uh, securities laws. And unlike the vast majority of respondents of targets of these commissions who settle and sign consent orders, uh, they decided not only to contest the allegations, but to mount structural constitutional claims. Uh, they both uh, objected, for example, to the uh, dual layer tenure protection of the commission's administrative law judges. Uh, they can only be removed for cause, and they can only be removed for cause by the Merit System Protection Board, which itself as members who only can be removed by cause for cause. And their claim was that uh, this was unconstitutional, that it violates the Article II uh, Executive Take Care Clause, uh, which gives the president the power uh, to remove uh, officers. And uh, they claimed that having to litigate before these unconstitutional ALJs would uh, impose uh, injury upon them. Uh, in addition, in the Axon case, uh, Axon uh, had another claim that the combination of the prosecutorial and adjudicative function uh, by the commission, uh, by its uh, staff, and by the ALJs uh, violates what's called the non-delegation doctrine that Congress uh, it didn't provide an intelligible principle uh, in that regard. Uh, and uh, that um, in the case we'll discuss a little bit, uh, related claim is that it deprives respondents of, of a right to a, a jury trial. So the, there was a split of authority. Uh, the Ninth Circuit in Axon and six other circuits all held that you can't go into district court. You have to go through the whole proceeding first and then like any other adverse commission order appeal to the applicable federal court of appeals. But the Fifth Circuit in the Cochrane case uh, held otherwise and held that no, there is district court jurisdiction. So that split of authority led to the uh, courts, uh, Supreme Court's granting cert in both cases. Um, I, I can discuss the basis for the holding if you'd like me to. I, I, I would, and, and you, you brought up uh, Jarkazi, and I was, I, I, I was um, 
surprised or not surprised, but I, I was ra my eyebrows raised when I had seen a Law 360 article on that case and the and the three grounds that were separately set out for the unconstitutionality uh, of the court, the decision that relating to the Fifth Circuit case. And the heading said justices to decide the future of administrative courts. That seemed like a pretty bold statement, uh, meaning <laughs> are, are, are they going to have a future at all? Uh, uh, can yeah, I, I do not think that is an overstatement. Okay. Uh, because as Justice Kagan said in, well, I'll call the Axon opinion, although it was the consolidated opinion in the Axon and Cogren, mm -hmm. uh, she repeatedly said these are existential claims against the way these commissions conduct their business. Uh, you know, particularly with respect to going after civil enforcement targets. And a Fifth Circuit panel in the Jarkizi case, um, which did not go to district court because the enforcement target in that case, Mr. Jarkizi, went through the process, um, held that um, these administrative proceedings uh, deprive uh, him of the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial, uh, that there's no intelligible principle for either of these commissions, in that case, the SEC deciding whether to uh, litigate uh, with its own uh, you know, home court advantage, literally its home court advantage by taking the cases in-house or by going to a district court, the commissions can elect to do either. And also that, the, as I mentioned earlier, that the ALJ's um, uh, layers of removal protection uh, violates uh, uh, presidential powers. So uh, that case is, is being briefed. Uh, we at the Atlantic Legal Foundation will be filing an amicus brief in that case. And um, it, and I think that it's an existential uh, threat, not only to the FTC and the SEC in terms of their in-house enforcement actions, um, but also to other agencies that employ ALJs. And uh, Malcolm, I, I happened to look at the uh, OPM website, and interestingly, uh, there are 1,900 ALJ is employed by the federal government. If you leave out the 1,600 of them that are employed by the Social Security Administration, there are approximately 300 ALJs who are employed uh, or assigned to various federal agencies. As Dave can explain, the FTC, I believe, only has one. The SEC currently has four. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is under scrutiny by the Supreme Court has won, and then there were various numbers at other agencies. So it's not just the FTC and the SEC that might be uh, affected by a structural constitutional holding on the part of the Supreme Court regarding civil administrative enforcement proceedings. Real, I, I, I wanted you, for the benefit of all of us, including me, to give us some examples of what you refer to as structural constitutional claims. Um, can you can you give us a brief rundown? I, I know the Seventh Amendment is probably one of them, which was brought right. up in Casey. Okay. With the well, right actually, the brief. Supreme Court has already decided one of them previously, which is that ALJs have to be constitutionally appointed uh, by the agency head. And... Uh, the SEC has, you know, fixed that problem. Um, the, the deprivation of a right to a jury trial, uh, an agency or commission that combines the prosecutorial and uh, adjudicative function. Uh, and, and these are all alleged grounds, structural constitutional claims that have been or uh, litigated or are uh, in the process of being litigated. Um, the allocation of uh, responsibility for pursuing antitrust cases between the Department of Justice Antitrust Division and the FTC is another. Uh, the removal protection of the ALJs, uh, the, the 
the, the FTC and the SEC have their own procedural and, and evidentiary rules that are different from the federal rules and in the view of many defense counsel are decidedly uh, tilted in the direction of the agencies. So when you combine that with the home court advantage where there's almost 100% success rate uh, on the part of the commissions, um, that that becomes problematic. There are other systemic problems that are structural or potential structural constitutional claims, years long delays of uh, both uh, Axon Enterprise and Ms. Cochran were caught up in the, these agency proceedings for years. I think uh, in the case of Jarkizi, it was uh, more than a, a decade before he was able to get to the Supreme Court uh, after waiting for a final SEC uh, order that allowed him to appeal. Um, some would argue that there is a demonstrable systemic bias in favor of the agencies. And one other example, uh, which the court has not yet taken up, although it's had the opportunity, is what's called the SEC gag rule. In the vast majority of cases, um, targets of the SEC and, and probably of the uh, FTC um, sign consent orders rather than litigate. When you sign a consent order with the SEC, there's a lifetime gag where you agree not to in any way criticize the SEC's wisdom in bringing the suit. Uh, you certainly can't contest the allegations uh, in any way. Uh, the commission can say whatever it wants, including by putting out a uh, reasonably accusatory press release after consent order is signed, but the respondent's not allowed to say anything. So those are, those are some examples, and they kind of underscore why this jurisdictional ruling is so important in the Axon case. David, let me turn to you for a second, because it was interesting, considering your background and your tenure with the FTC, did you notice uh, let's, uh, an expansion of, uh, let's say, prosecutorial um, activity or what they saw to be as their, uh, as their um, um, authority in that process? Or was it, I, mean, I, I guess the question fundamentally is, this this decision, Axon, as I recall, was was a uh, as a nine to nothing decision. I know there's concurrences, but there's no dissent. So it's so the total court saw something wrong here in making that decision. Um, so I guess my question is: is it is it that they've seen a, a tilt or an imbalance that's occurred over the last X years, or what is your view on that? Uh, that that's a very good question. Um, you know, one thing about Axon, I um, I don't view that as being all that inconsistent or ground shaking in terms of, of uh, recognizing that there are situations where people can uh, uh, take challenges to administrative actions without completing the, the process. Uh, if you go back, I mean, Kripe, uh, I can't even remember the name of the case. It predates me, on, uh, my arrival on the planet, I believe. But Leadham versus Kane is such a case where, where I think, it, as I recall, it involved a, um, uh, a labor uh, matter. And uh, the allegation there was that the agency was exceeding its authority, it was acting ultra varies. And the court said, well, if it's acting ultra varies, we ought to step in and, and, and take a look at that. Uh, it, it can be stopped uh, without going through the entire process. And then you take a look at, uh, if you consider some of the uh, civil cases like uh, uh, official immunity, judicial immunity, and things like that, it's an, it's an immunity from being sued, uh, from even having to defend an action. So when you take a, uh, a case, uh, and uh, if it fits into certain structural claims that are very fundamental and go to the very core of, of, uh, of how things work, I can understand why a unanimous court might very easily and without doing anything too radical would say, yes, we can pause and take a look at that. And that's how I tend to uh, read the Axon decision. Uh, okay. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but- Malcolm, well, it, I'd like to comment on that also, if I may. Sure. 
And, and let me let me digress for a minute, by the but way. Before uh, you do, Larry, just be, uh, let me tell you what prompted me to ask the question. And that, because then I'll give you even more fodder for your answer. Uh, because once I saw the, um, uh, when, once I saw Axon and we, and we saw the, the result, and then we find the um, Law 360 that I was talking about in Jarkazi saying uh, how, how far that now that the court has taken the, um, agreed to hear those, uh, that case, the question is, and Illumina, it sounds like they're, they're really uh, they're they're laser focused on this, and yes, they're trying to send a message. Perhaps they're trying to send a message to the administrative agencies to uh, shore up your uh, your procedures so that you don't have structural constitutional challenges that can be made against your procedures. That was my reading. So uh, not not focusing on it. So I think know. many of the the structural claims are really. Uh, insofar as they have merit the fault of Congress, because they're built right into the organic statutes of the commissions, you know, the authority, for example, to pursue an enforcement target, either by going to district court or by uh, conducting the proceeding in-house. I mean, that's built into the statute. And uh, just to digress for a second, uh, Dave and I, I, I can't resist saying this, are very good friends. We literally walked into the Justice Department together on the same day uh, 51 years ago uh, and have kind of grown up together as lawyers. So I, uh, that said, I do want to... Uh, Closing in on 52, I think. Okay, maybe 52. But that said, um, I, I, I'm not sure the cases that, that Dave was alluding to are the kinds of cases, uh, claims that were involved in the Axon uh, yeah, if, if I can clarify that, it, I, I agree, they were not the kinds, but the fact is, is that it, what Axon has done is consistent with other cases. That's the only point that, and, and I don't mean to belittle the seriousness of the structural cases, nor the seriousness that the court is now uh, approaching those arguments uh, uh, with which it is now approaching these audiences. And if you dig into the Axon case and the basis for the court's ruling, uh, I think it becomes clearer uh, why the court held what it held because of the so-called Thunder Basin factors, but I'm not sure you want to get into that right now, Malcolm. No, but why don't you just give us a little bit of that in terms of how, how does Exxon uh, inform us as we're reading the tea leaves regarding what's going to happen in Jarkazi, or does it? Uh, what would you argue before the Supreme Court if you were on the Jarkazi case after Axon's been decided? Well, I think there are, uh, I, I think that if you read Justice Kagan's opinion and also uh, the concurring opinion of Justice Gorsuch in Axon, uh, they both express a lot of empathy for the uh, enforcement targets in these cases because what they have had to endure. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you noted at the very beginning, the issue for the court in Axon was whether there was an implied stripping of federal question jurisdiction on the part of district courts. And the, the court unanimously held, no, there is no implied stripping of federal question jurisdiction for these structural constitutional claims. And when the, the court went through this three-part test called the Thunder Basin test, three factors, the most important factor uh, is whether uh, requiring the respondent to go through the entire proceeding would foreclose what the court 30 years ago in Thunder Basin called meaningful judicial review. And the, the answer was clearly yes. If you have to sit on your structural constitutional claims, um, you would lose the opportunity for meaningful judicial review. It's what Justice Tagan called a, a here and now injury, being subjected to an unconstitutional proceeding that would be impossible to remedy, in her words, 
once the proceeding is over. She said that a proceeding that already has happened cannot be undone. And the kinds of injuries that respondents like uh, Axon Enterprise and Michelle Corcoran and uh, Jarkezi and, and others have claimed are these here and now injuries, uh, the harm of having to be subjected to uh, an unconstitutional administrative process, as well as enduring a years long administrative proceeding and the attendant um, litigation burdens and, and costs, and also reputational harm. I mean, there are real world consequences uh, to having to be subjected to these types of proceedings. And if they drag on and on, uh, that just exacerbates uh, the harm. And I think, you, you, Malcolm, you would find hints of, of that empathy, of that concern in Justice Gorsuch's uh, concurring opinion, as well as in uh, Justice Kagan's uh, opinion for the uh, unanimous uh, court. Uh, and uh, uh, both Gorsuch and also Justice Thomas had some additional interesting things to say about this. I, and well, in my practice, I would say the same thing, and that's been the experience. It's just the, the, the thing we're not directly talking about besides time is money. The cost of the process ends up, in many cases, the uh, defendant cannot conduct their they, they, their reputation has, has been shot, so they can't even conduct their uh, area or their profession, and consequently, their their lifeblood gets cut off, and at the same time, it drags on for years. And some have just had to drop those claims. And, they and just, so they, and so, they, and and so they yes, and so they sign consent orders, and often they'll be overreaching in the consent orders. So the FTC, for example, in in the Axon case, required. Uh, uh, Axon was willing to consign, sign a consent order, as I understand the record, but uh, the FTC wanted them to turn over their intellectual property to the to their um, to the corporation they had to set up as a, a competitor to undo the the acquisition, and they felt that that was unreasonable. But the vast majority will settle, and if you settle, you give up your right to challenge the allegations, they give up the right to go to a federal court of appeals. So even if you have legitimate structural constitutional claims, they'll never be heard. And that's another reason why the court in Axon emphasized the ability to um, go to district court is so important. So what are the tea leaves that we read in Jarchese? Do what, what do we think the court's going to do? Why have they granted uh, to hear the case? Well, I, I would say that the tea leaves are that the court is going to have some uh, real problems, uh, certainly with the, the, the uh, tenure of administrative law judges. Um, and uh, I'm not, I, I think that if the court were to hold that there is a fundamental constitutional problem combining uh, the uh, prosecutorial function and the adjudicatory function within an agency. And I'm not making a prediction on that, but if they were to do that, I think that would really uh, upset, um, literally upset the uh, administrative enforcement schemes of numerous uh, federal regulatory agencies that rely on administrative law judges. Uh, even when there is theoretically under agency regulations a separation of, of prosecutorial staff from, uh, you know, adjudicatory staff, I, I still think that there they would there'd be a problem if the court were to hold that. And if you go back and read Justice Thomas's concurring opinion in the Axon case, he says that he feels there's a serious question about whether administrative adjudications are constitutional at all. Mm -hmm. uh, he, and he thinks that's an issue. He says in his concurring opinion, this is an issue that the court should address in a future appropriate case. He wonders whether 
administrative adjudications violate the separation of powers, the judicial power uh, under Article Three. And so uh, I think Sorry, that Jarkizi has the while while Exxon is very important in in recognizing the lack of meaningful judicial review if you have to wait and giving respondents the opportunity to go to district court without having to go through the whole proceeding. I think the um, Jarkizi decision could be revolutionary when it comes to uh, uh, agency in-house adjudications. I, I, and I was just about to turn to David and ask his view on that. Well, certainly, if uh, if things go the way Justice Thomas has suggested they might go, uh, I agree with Larry. It would be a, a fundamental uh, change in in uh, the way agency uh, agencies operate and in the way laws are enforced or not enforced. I tend to be hopeful that at least a majority of the court will take a more seasoned approach, if you will. And, uh, and, and a more practical approach in looking at some of these issues and would um, uh, ask questions. And, and, you know, you see it in the CFPB case, you see it in Humphrey's executor. Uh, although Humphrey's executor, I, I admit, is a hard case to defend uh, in light of, uh, of post developments. But on the other hand, if you look at the decision carefully, if you look at the CFPB decision carefully, you can see in there uh, the courts focus on some very practical things. One person agencies versus, um, uh, in the case of the CFPB, uh, versus multi-member bipartisan agencies with staggered terms, where you have an, a body of experts. And you know, one of the things I used to tell applicants at the FTC was that one advantage in working at the FTC is that you don't get whiplash when there's a change in administrations. And by that, I meant that, uh, you know, with five commissioners and a bipartisan uh, uh, commission on there and a real serious commitment by and large, not always, but by and large to continuing and seeing through the work of pre predecessor commissioners and, 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 and the work, there was always an effort at some continuity. And that's exactly the sort of thing that I think uh, the court was concerned about in CFPB, where you have one person for five year term and when that person is gone, an entirely different administration moves in and, uh, and, and, can, and can chart an entirely different course, course. And then, of course, as Larry alluded to, there is the, uh, uh, the question about uh, uh, congressional supervision and whether that's been adequate. In the case of the CFPB, where the appropriations even aren't dependent on, what, on anything from Congress. It's a much, much different animal than with the, with the FTC and some of the agencies where um, Congress has never hesitated to, um, uh, to divert funds or hold funds or tell agencies that they cannot or can do, can or cannot do something. Um, an interesting example, if I, if I could go back to the uh, 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 early 80s, is KidVid where the FTC had the audacity to suggest there might be something wrong with advertising to children. And, uh, and Congress uh, reacted to that. And the agency dropped those challenges. Uh, but the fact is, is that it's continued you know, from time to time in the past when you have an active Congress that is concerned with its role in oversight of the agencies and you have an appropriations process that speaks to that and a judicial review authority uh, you know, I think things are just much different than they are in the context of the CFPB. Uh, the court seemed to point to that in, uh, in that decision, and hopefully it will, hopefully, at least I hope, that it will point to that in, in, the, in Jarkizi and some of the other cases when it comes to, to um, uh, the constitutionality of those agencies. They're important, they fulfill an important function, and, uh, and they're constituted the way they are for a reason. And Malcolm, as, as you know, the Supreme Court is uh, deciding, you, you know, through the Atlantic Legal Foundation, the Supreme Court is deciding whether the self-funding mechanism of the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, violates the appropriations clause. And, and you saw the amicus brief that we filed. Uh, yes. That it does. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and there, uh, there's a corollary to this because when I was in reviewing the Law 360 report, they said the circuit court, of course, we're back to Jarkazi for a moment. 
And it says the circuit court also determined that the SEC overstepped its bounds by it deciding whether cases should be heard in house or in a federal district court. So I, I, I guess the, I would ask a little bit about uh, procedure now. Uh, I know that says SEC and not FTC, David, but perhaps it's, uh, it's either similar or identical or whatever. Uh, but the question is, is that a decision that is made by the agency itself, uh, which the, the notation suggests that it should be something that should be agreed upon between the litigants as opposed to unilaterally decided by the agency? Am I reading that right? I think that's that's why it may be said. Um, and, and let me just um, make sure I have your question that what, what you're concerned with is is how the proceeding is brought judicially or administratively and um, and the decision to do that. And, you know, look, I think really that Congress has laid out a framework for the agencies to act in. It says enforce these laws. Don't create new laws, enforce these laws. Congress decides which laws it wants the agencies to enforce. It assigns those laws to the agency. They don't make up new laws, they enforce the ones Congress assigns. In selecting cases, the agencies exercise some discretion, which they are entitled or should be entitled to do. Um, and it, it, it's a digression. But I've, I've been in, in some of these foreign assistance uh, 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 matters where we've been in countries with emerging economies and, and the mandate in those countries is investigate everything. If somebody files a complaint, investigate it. And so the agencies that are underfunded, understaffed and, and everything else are running after a bunch of rabbits and don't have time to deal with the real issues. Congress has given the agencies that discretion. Now, do they bring it administratively or judicially? Uh, that is a decision Congress has allowed the agencies to decide with a certain amount of discretion. But again, the, the limits are set by Congress. You can bring it in court or you can bring it administratively. You can't invent some new procedure. You can't do something entirely different. You get chocolate or you get vanilla, but you can't make a different flavor. And that's, I think that's all that is. And um, uh, uh, whether that's unfair or not, I tend to think it's, um, uh, you know, you come up the same way eventually. If you go administratively, you get a trial before an administrative law judge. And Paul, I've heard a lot of comment today about the amount of time. I won't comment on that for other agencies, but at least the FTC. And we used to measure this and, 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 and keep a close eye on it. The amount of time for an administrative adjudication uh, between issuance of administrative complaint and a decision that would be passed to the commission and to get to the court of appeals is not much different than the than in a typical federal district court civil case. So the amount of time district court cases take a long time too. Complex antitrust cases can take years and even decades, as we know. Um, but, but the fact is, is that the agency uh, has processes to move these things along. It tries to move them along. Discovery sometimes gets complex and it can be protracted. And yes, it's expensive, but it's the same process that you would get in a federal district court. In terms of evidence, um, Larry says they, uh, or points to the argument that they have, uh, they've made up their own rules of evidence. Uh, I've never seen a set of rules of evidence in the FTC other than the federal rules. And, um, and that is a guidepost, but you have a bench trial without a jury, judges are given a great deal of leeway with how they apply the rules of evidence and what they do with them. At the end of the day, the question is, is it supportable? Is there a preponderance of real, admissible, useful, uh, reliable evidence that supports a decision? If there is, then it can be sustained on that ground. If there isn't, then it's reversed. And then, you know, in terms of legal issues and legal analysis, as I said, agencies don't make up new laws or, or new rules, and that's subject to de novo review, and the courts always take a de novo review, de novo approach to reviewing legal issues. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the view from the other side. No, that's, that's helpful. My, my concern has always been in advising clients on it that uh, the, the, not necessarily the length of time for a given procedure, but the length of time 
for consecutive procedures and saying, well, after this, you may have to do that. And that's when, where, the, where the cost becomes and the time becomes uh, potentially um, uh, insurmountable for some clients who are not quite at the level of, of a hedge fund manager who I think was Mr. Jarchese's uh, job. Okay, he may, he may have resources that some people don't have. Larry, I, I, thank you. Larry, I wanted to go back to you uh, because I wanted you to know if you wanted to comment further. We were talking earlier about uh, the structural constitutional claims, but I wanted you to give us maybe a little bit of background uh, and uh, to give us uh, more flavor on both Axon and uh, Cochrane. Well, uh... I think in terms of the factual background, uh, you know, these were two enforcement targets who um, decided that they uh, needed to litigate. Uh, I think the record reflects Axon was willing to settle uh, until the FTC demanded that it turn over its intellectual property. Um, you know, they both tried to go to the district court with structural constitutional uh, claims. Jarkizi didn't have to do that. Um, one thing that I would like to comment on is uh, a little bit more about Justice Gorsuch's uh, concurring opinion. Be I've already mentioned that Justice Thomas has serious concerns he expressed in his concurring opinion uh, about the, the constitutionality of the entire notion of allowing uh, federal agencies to adjudicate in-house. Uh, Justice Gorsuch only concurred in the judgment, but not in the way uh, Justice Kagan got there. Uh, in, in Justice uh, Gorsuch's view, uh, this was a pretty simple question uh, answered by 28 U.S. Code 1331, federal question jurisdiction. Uh, he said, and these were his words, that 1331 is as clear as statutes get. And he, he said that, you know, the, the statute says that district courts shall have federal question jurisdiction. And that's where he would have stopped on with this. He was heavily critical of these Thunder Basin factors, which he uh, described as a um, judicially made up set of uh, balancing factors that um, you would have to satisfy uh, in order to get to section 1331. And he uh, completely disagreed with that. And one of the ways he disagreed with that was by pointing out the real world costs of having to um, go through these administrative proceedings. Um, let me just read you a couple of sentences from his concurrence. He says, not many possess the perseverance of Ms. Cochran or Axon, the cost, time, and uncertainty associated with litigating a raft of opaque jurisdictional factors will deter many people from even trying to reach the court of law to which they are entitled. And uh, nor is the loss of a day in court in favor of one uh, uh, before an agency a small thing. And this may answer part of your earlier question, Malcolm. Justice uh, Gorsuch says the numbers reveal how tilted the game is. So that may give you some hint about where he would uh, come down uh, as well. Give uh, uh, by the way, and I noted that, uh, and I also noted that uh, Justice Thomas had a concurring opinion. What did that? What did that do to the uh, to enlighten things, or what was his view of, um, and why was it important? Well, his view is important because he 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 raises fundamental separation of powers concerns about allowing an agency to adjudicate. Uh, followed by what he described as highly deferential uh, judicial review. Deferential because under most statutes, and Dave can correct me, but I think the FTC Act is one of them, uh, 
a reviewing court of appeals, you know, reviewing an appeal from an FTC um, order, uh, has to accept the um, factual findings of the commission and uh, has, uh, as long as they're based on substantial evidence, and uh, also gives a lot of deference. And it can have de novo review of, of legal rulings, but it's still fairly deferential. And um, his, his uh, opinion is very interesting to read because he talks about the history of administrative adjudications and how during the first hundred years, it was kind of, as, as Dave put it, either a chocolate or a vanilla thing. Uh, and, and if you got to court, if the courts had jurisdiction, um, they could start from scratch in, in terms of, you know, whether uh, a statute has been violated. But that's all changed with the growth of the administrative state with the idea that um, agencies, because of their expertise, for example, the antitrust expertise of, of the FTC, uh, should receive a lot of deference in the judgments they make on who to go after civilly, uh, civilly uh, as well as making recommendations on criminal prosecutions and uh, their factual findings. So, so I would I would recommend to anyone interested in this topic to read the two concurring opinions, as well as Justice Kagan's opinion. I, I would also do the same thing. I read them, and unlike some decisions, they are fascinating, especially to those of us who have been educated in the U.S. and have gone to law school here and taken constitutional law. I mean, they were they were fascinating. I even had went back and remembered. You, you gentlemen are, uh, based on what you said earlier, Larry, you're a little bit senior to me, but not by far. And I'll just tell you that I remember- Only, only just by a little bit. Yeah, yes, I, the, exactly. Just by a hair, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, uh, but uh, I remember when I took uh, admin law in law school, and I remember the instructor pounding the table saying, you have to exhaust your administrative remedies. And it was like one of the, that was one of those phrases, like the rule against perpetuities. It just seemed to reverberate for, for years to come in practice. But it does lead me to one last question that I'll have, because we're running uh, through our hour right now, is that I've done a fair amount of uh, agency proceedings too at the state level. And um, so the, I read these decisions, not just for the FTC, SEC, and related uh, federal agency applications, but also uh, I was thinking about how I would approach a state agency administrative proceeding. And it seems to me that the decisions give us some guideposts for, um, for uh, dealing with what we may see as uh, constitutionally um, questionable proceedings by state agencies, because those do exist from time to time also. Any comment from either one of you on that? Well, I'll, I'll defer to Dave, except to say it's important to keep in mind the difference between case-specific claims and what we've been discussing today, which are structural constitutional claims, which are not dependent on uh, uh, the allegations in a particular case or upon you know, rulings made by a a uh, state uh, adjudicatory agency, but maybe Dave has a different perspective on that. I do not have a different perspective at all. Uh, in my mind, there are a lot of states out there and there's each one has its own constitution and any issue about constitutional application in the context of those states has got to turn on, on that document. Exactly, and I, and I think that's correct. And I would also say that we, that at the same time, it makes sure that the practitioners who are there looks at those constitutional issues rather than just the practical application of the facts. I think that's, uh, at least that would be my takeaway based on my, my experience. We have one question and we're right at the very end. I'm not, it's an interesting question, but I'm not sure that we can answer it in the time we have. The question says, any chance a complaint against Pfizer filed with the FTC for the COVID-19 vaccine injury where autopsies show caused uh, that there's a medical certainty due to mRNA gene therapy, would that be appropriate? I, th I guess the question is, would it be appropriate to file a complaint against Pfizer with the FTC and would it go anywhere? I guess that would be, uh, that would be the question. I guess it would go to you, David. I'm dubious. 
that it would go anywhere. I mean, the fact is, is that uh, uh, the FTC enforces the FTC Act, uh, unfair and deceptive acts or practices that are affecting commerce or illegal. And um, uh, so in order to hang anything on uh, Pfizer for that, it would have to be, uh, I, I suspect, a deception case, not a, uh, uh, and whether the commission would have any appetite for that given the uh, FDA's authority. And now there are MOUs, believe it or not, a memorandum of understanding between the FTC and the FDA and many other agencies. Uh, but the fact is, is that sounds really like to me, a, a FDA issue. I think so. I agreed. Agreed. Well, gentlemen, we have reached the, that we're a minute or so over. I want to thank you both for your analysis. Uh, I find this uh, absolutely fascinating and applicable across the board in our practices for those that do practice before administrative agencies and for those that are looking at finding ways to assure that our clients get justice. Um, I would like to also invite both of you to come back after we find out uh, what is happening in connection with um, uh, Mr. Jarkazi. And uh, I'd like us to, I will invite you to come back and uh, update us uh, at the Beverly Hills Bar Association at that time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Larry. Thank you, David. Bye.